Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Fuente and Marifal present me, the professor. Hello, world. Hello, everyone. Hey, hey Papa, what's Papa, up? What you doing? doing good, brother. Doing good. It's great to see everybody. Today we have an excellent show, a very exciting show, and most probably a legendary show. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. David Garofalo. David, welcome to the show. Well, what an honor to be asked to come here. I, I, I have been watching uh, past episodes. I saw who your guests are, and I said, oh, my God, when I got the call, I said, they're running out of people. Uh, but <laughs> it, it, it's an honor to be asked and an honor to be here. So thank you so much. Oh, man, it, the honor is ours, David, my old friend from many, many years. Uh, you know, I see your smile and everything. You haven't changed much. You know, <laughs> we just... I, I just have a pharmacy closer to me than you probably do, but uh, it's good to see you, man. I hope everything is well with you and your family and uh, brings you. back so many memories. I remember when you and your mom came to Chateau de Fuente. Yes. When, when there was really nothing there in the very beginning. What a wonderful time. It's good to see you on the show, my brother. My pleasure. It's, it's wonderful uh, all these years uh, watching everybody grow and everybody doing well. And uh, it's, a, it's been a wonderful journey. And uh, I hope it continues on for, for all of us for many more years. Absolutely. Well, Professor. Today, uh, today's a show that uh, when we talked about it, I mean, Carlito was excited. Jeremiah had heard everybody on it. I mean, Dave Garofalo. There's a saying in Spanish by a famous uh, Argentinian tango that says, 20 años no es nada, and it translates to 20 years is nothing. But in your case, it's been 35 years. Yes. Of being very successful, fighting for the industry, being, creating a lot of stuff, being an innovator. And I mean, we're gonna talk a lot. There's a lot of questions, and I know you have a huge following. So we're going to start off with this. As a young kid growing up in Boston, I know you had your inclinations towards sports. What <laughs> did you like growing up? Tell us a bit. What in sports did I like? Yeah. I, I liked I like? Pro professional wrestling of all crazy things. And um, very, very tough for um, a five foot five kid uh, to like it and want to get into it. But um, I always uh, followed my dreams and I tried everything that I wanted to do. I'm not going to be a guy that's going to die and say, I wish I would have tried. Uh, I tried everything, including that, as crazy as that sounds. And uh, as luck would have it, it didn't work out so well for me. Uh, on the way to the hospital after the second match, I said, uh, I think I'm going to give this up. Three years of training and, and two <laughs> matches. Uh, I gave it up then and uh, boy, did that work out well for me. It sure did. But you, but, you had a, but you had a professional name. I did. I, I was the grappler. I wore a mask, and um, I trained for three years for it, and lifts in my boots and the whole bit. A lot of people don't know. I know, uh, Jose, we go back a long time, so you know uh, um, all the uh, things inside my closet, and, uh, and uh, did you start off with this one, so uh, I don't know what I'm in for for today, but it's an open book. I have nothing to hide. I'm, I'm, I'm proud of my mistakes. That was a mistake, uh, and I'm proud of it, and I'm the person I am today for those type of things. No, no, I know, and I know you still love wrestling and, and all that, and, uh, but you, you went on to other things. So I guess you grew up being a Patriot fan and a Red Sox fan. Yeah, yeah, Boston's a big sports town, and uh, uh, that was it. And unfortunately, as time went on, and I got more into my business life, uh, I, I got away from all that, and my sport of choice is business. And um, that's what I end up doing. I, I love it. I love talking about it. And, um, you know, I love this. I, you know, we're, we're in the cigar industry. You know, uh, that's what we talk about. We talk about uh, something we happen to love. And part of that is not just the love of the cigar, but I love the business itself, uh, the people in it and the people that come into it. So it's been wonderful, for, wonderful life so far. Definitely. That is, uh, I know I've known you for the last uh, 20 something years and it's been great. Funny thing, we've never had a yes or a no. And uh, we agree on most of the topics. Mm -hmm. So right out of college, uh, tell us, 
a little bit of what you do. I, I think I heard something about some disco things. I didn't know that. Yeah, so I didn't do college. Actually, a uh, very poor student. I barely got through high school. Not that I was a, a screw up. I, I was a uh, good boy always. But um, I just couldn't pass a test. But I, but I got through and got my uh, high school diploma. But while I was in high school, during um, uh, school break, um, you know, we have uh, school vacation, whatever it's called. Um, I got a uh, little job in between uh, during the school week. And, and it was working at a diner, a cable car diner, like the 50 style diner. And um, after the third day working there, and I was going to work there all week, the, the man that I worked for, uh, he seemed so miserable at what he was working there. And I said, why do you do what you do? And he said, well, I inherited this from my mother, and this is my job, and I own this. And I said, well, you should work somewhere else because you seem so unhappy. And he said, uh, well, what am I going to do? I said, I don't know what you're going to do, but you shouldn't do this for the rest of your life. You're unhappy. And he says, uh, and just walk away. I said, no, you sell your business. And he said, sell my business. He said, who's going to buy my business? And I said, I'd be interested in buying your business. And he says, well, how do you evaluate a business? And I said, um, I heard that you do two and a half times what you make, two and a half times your earnings. So how about, what do you make a year? And I don't, I don't know what that number was. Let's say it was um, $25,000. We're talking 1978. And uh, I said it would be two and a half times that, which would be uh, $55,000. And he said, um, I would take $55,000. And I said, well, I would like to give it to you. Can I, can I buy your business? And he said, yes. And he said, are you serious? And I said, I'm real serious. I'm, real serious. I, I'm in high school at the time. And he said, I'll take it. And I said, well, there's one problem. And he said, what's that? And I said, I don't have any money. <laughs> and, and he said, why would, you, why would you bring this up to me? And I said, uh, well, I have an idea. And he said, what's that? And I said, I will give you $1,000 a week, every week for 55 weeks. It's two and a half times more than you make now. And I'll give it to you every single week. And if I miss a week, you take the whole place back. We'll just write something up that it'll be 55 weeks of this. And when I, if I miss at 54 weeks, you got all the money, two and a half years worth. But I won't, I'll never miss a, a week. But if I do, that's your insurance plan. And he said, let's do it. So I went home uh, and my mother said, how was working today? And I said, good. I said, I'm going to buy the, the restaurant. And she said, oh, really? And she just walked away from me like, you're crazy. And 10 minutes later, the doorbell rang and it was the guy. And she said, what the hell's going on here? And she screamed up to my father, John, come down here. Your son's doing something crazy or something. And he said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm going to buy the restaurant. And they said, oh, really? You don't have any money. I said, well, this is how I'm going to do it. And the guy's standing there. And I got two pieces of paper and I wrote the contract out on two pieces of paper. I said, I can't start this until the end of May till I graduate high school, but uh, can I come by and work for free after work so I can learn how to do this stuff? And he said, you wanna work for free? Of course. And um, from there, I, I learned what, what I did in between. And the day I got out of high school, I owned the restaurant. And I did that for about three years. Uh, and again, I, you know, here's a diner that opened at five o'clock in the morning and closed at two in the afternoon. Uh, I learned how to become a disc jockey and uh, in between, and I would do high school dances and things like that, and um, I was doing that at nighttime, and three and a half years into it, I sold a diner, and I went full-time into the disc jockey business, and um, that worked out good because we had the big disco craze that was going on, and I would turn bar rooms into discotheques. And that business worked out real good. And um, as I, I was talking earlier to you, uh, this is how my love of cigars came about. Because in those days, you could smoke a cigar in the uh, discotheque. You could smoke cigars everywhere. You could smoke cigarettes everywhere. And I would take a cigar within, with me into the nightclub every night. Now, at the beginning of a, a night in the nightclub, the DJs would be basically playing to the ashtrays. That's what we called it. There were no people there. And people wanted to come in fashionably a little later. 
than yeah. opening as opposed to standing there. And as the DJ, I would light my cigar up and I would smoke a cigar and play the next song and the next song, but I'm not playing to anybody and people would start trickling in until my cigar got to the end. The cigar got to the end, I put it in the ashtray and it was showtime and then I would play to the, to the crowd. That went really good. Uh, I did that for about 12 years, but now I'm just working nights. And it was about five, five hours a night. So what am I going to do all day? Uh, go bother my friends at their jobs and things like that. I tried that for a while. I tried golfing. I wasn't good at that either. So I would be going to the cigar shop to buy a cigar. And I go, well, I can open up a little smoke shop. And I say smoke shop because we're still called Two Guys Smoke Shop. And the reason being is in those days, there were no cigar shops. It was smoke shops because you had to actually carry other things. There wasn't enough cigar business. This was the in the eighties. The cigar business was at a, at its worst. You know, if you historically look at it, that's when it pretty much tanked, and um, we had to sell other things. So it was cigarettes, and it was chewing tobacco, and pipe tobacco, and cigarettes, and magazines, and statues, and all kinds of crazy stuff. And uh, that business, uh, I which I loved, but I was taking my money from my nightclub business and basically pouring in the drain of the smoke shop business. I was losing money in the smoke shop business, making a lot of money in the nightclub business, and praying that the day would come that I could someday just do the smoke shop business. And that took a while. And uh, I'm answering a long, long question. I hope that's the, the way you want me to talk. Of course, Telling, of course uh, yeah. The, um, the smoke shop business, as it was just at a standstill, I had to decide one day that the only way to succeed was to jump in with both feet and give it my all because doing half the business as nightclub, half the business as a smoke shop, I had to go all in. When I did go all in, um, we grew at that point. I was able to open three stores in Boston and um, for a, a young, at that time, 25 year old kid in the cigar business, it was funny, the reps coming in and telling me, kid, you missed it. The, 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 the show is over. It's 1985. Uh, you missed it. You know, the sixties was the time or something here. It is 85. Uh, but as luck would have it again, uh, you hang in there for a while. 1990 came. And all of a sudden, younger people were smoking cigars. People were talking about cigars. 1992 comes out. A magazine comes out talking about cigars in an unbelievable uh, nice light that it brought onto it as a luxury product. Uh, I remember looking at the magazine myself in high gloss and beautiful pictures and reading descriptions of of the flavor notes of cigars. And here I am at that time now, seven years into the business, learning the business for the first time. And from there, I mean, I went from, from liking cigars to loving cigars at that point. And uh, it's just been uphill all the time and, and watching all the, the, uh, the family owned businesses and stuff grow together uh, during that boom, seeing the strong survive, the cream rise to the top and you know, learning from, learning from our mistakes and learning from other people's successes and just keep going and going. It, what a ride it's been. Uh, and I hope it's gonna be many, many more because I, I, I have not, you know, I told you the wrestling business, the, the uh, restaurant business, the nightclub business, these were all very short lived to me, for me, until it became the cigar business. And that was the end of it. I didn't have to look anymore. I found it. That's the answer. That's awesome. But you know, without all the ventures, there wouldn't be a David and Goliath. Why don't, yeah. you, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, David and Goliath? What it, what it motivated, what inspired you to write this story? Uh, you know, I've, I've always been the guy that thinks that um, um, raising tides raise all ships. And um, I, I always try to help retailers. And, uh, you know, I sat on the board of directors uh, for eight years on uh, IPCPR at, at TAA. Um, I've been to Washington, D.C. more than I've ever been on vacation in my life. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, it's always about if everybody gets better, we're all going to get better. And um, 
I, that's what I tried to do for years is try to help other retailers and kind of say, this is what I did and this is what worked for me. Um, there was always a lot of pushback though that, um, you know, we're competitors and, you know, I don't want to deal with you because you're my, you're my competitor. And I'm, I'm an aggressive competitor, to be honest with you too. You know, it, it's a lot of marketing and merchandising and, and promotion and get myself out there was always been, and that goes back to my nightclub days, right? I had to fill the nightclub. I had five hours to make the owner of the nightclub a whole bunch of money. So I took um, a little bit of the wrestling marketing. I took a little bit of the, of the nightclub stuff and I got into the cigar business and th this was the oddity of this this odd person being into the cigar business. I, I'm, I'm not of a Spanish descent and, uh, you know, a Cuban person or something. I'm uh, an Italian American here, a uh, city boy. And this is what I brought into it, um, which was very unique of um, bringing cigar people into cigar dinners and uh, promotional events and things like that. And, um, I thought to myself, I, I created a company called United Cigar years ago, trying to unite the retailers together in, in a learning session. It didn't work out the way it is. It still exists, but not the way it was, which was bi-weekly video conferences, just like this. And this was eight years ago. And to bring retailers in and talk about best practices and things like that, and I couldn't get them to bite. So I created a book, uh, David versus Goliath, and uh, this is it here. And, you know, it was um, Jose Orlando Padron that I talked to um, years ago when he says, David, you need to do three things in life. You have to plant a tree, you have to have a child, and you have to write a book. And he had just wrote the book. And here he was 90 years old writing the book. And I ordered the book immediately and I got the book and I put it aside for the next time I saw him. And unfortunately he passed away before I could get the book signed. And I thought to myself, I don't want to die and I better not wait till I'm 90 years old to do this, but what am I going to write a book on? And I tried many times to write a book on cigars. And each time I got to about 50 pages in, I read it and I was unhappy with it. And I said, I just don't know enough about cigars uh, to be able to pull this off. There's people that know much, much more about cigars than I do. But the part of the cigar business I'm in is the retail part of the cigar business. I sell cigars to the consumer and I drive people in to do it. And I created a very, very uh, popular store. We have a high volume store, one of the, one of the best um, as far as the amount of money coming in and the, and the customers, the, my employees. I have Ed Santa Maria yesterday. We celebrated 25 years as an employee for us. Uh, his mother was my first employee 10 years before that. And his son now is my employee now. Uh, that started about three months ago. He's 16 years old. He works part-time a, a few days a week with his dad in the store. And that's part of business too, of hanging on to employees and all this. So my idea of this was actually uh, at this time in life to tell them, to tell everybody all my secrets, everything that ever worked for me. It's 100 proven promotions for brick and mortar retailers, proven promotions. And I'll tell you, I wrote the book gave it to um, a company that gets it and looks at it. And there happened to have been 96 of them. And the lady said, you know, there's 96 uh, different things on here that you talk about. I said, oh, okay. She said, any chance you can do four more so we can call it 100? And I said, well, the only way I can do that is I'm going to have to do four more and actually do them and prove that they work because that's 100 proven promotions. I want to tell you, I'm not batting a thousand in this industry. Um, when you're a baseball player, you can bat 300, but not, not in business. You have to bat really good. You can't bat 1,000, but you've got to bat in the 700 range or something, or else you're going to go bankrupt. I don't tell you the ones that didn't work, and there's a whole bunch of them. I could make an encyclopedia of, of the things that didn't work, but these are the 100 promotions that worked. And in the book, I don't talk to cigar retailers. I talk to all retailer, brick-and-mortar retailers, and we talk about a bakery. And we talk about a hairdressing salon and all different things, restaurants and all this. But the truth is every single one of these promotions were done in a cigar shop because that's where I've been in the last 35 years. So to, to, for the masses, I write it to all of them. But for you, the brick and mortar retailer that's out there, this is 
for you. And this is things that work, little things that can help engage the, the customer, uh, have a better relationship with them, put more money into your bottom line, make you think as a business person. What I found in this industry is on the retail side is we have a lot of, a lot of hobbyists, which is uh, people that had a business going to basically retire and say, I'm going to open up a, a cigar shop. That's not what I did. I had to, I was 25 years old and I was going to get married and, and I was going to have a child. So this had to be a successful business. And I was, I was a business person to begin with. So um, I treated it as a business. You can still have fun treating it as a business, but you actually look at it as a business. And that's what I think this industry needs. They need to look at it more. So that's why I did it. There's promotions, but there's also in there tidbits of um, things that I learned along the way to help somebody look at it. You read one of the stories and you'd know some of the people. I don't, I don't name people by names. Um, I just mentioned to you, uh, Padron, but um, uh, you know, different people that we all know along the way that taught me a little something that I took that information and I developed a story around it. That's beautiful. Show us the book, David, so every, all the retailers could see it and tell us how they could obtain it. Um, it's on Amazon and all those places um, uh, or davidgarofalo.com. Uh, it's David versus Goliath, how to compete and beat the online giant, 100 proven promotions for brick and mortar retailers. So, you know, the name of the game, and I hear cigar retailers, all retailers complaining about online sales, uh, they're killing their business. They're only killing your business if you're running the business the way they're running their business, because you can't compete that way. You have to do it a different way. You can't play their game. And we have lots of things in brick and mortar that they can't do. So you highlight the things that you can do, which is ultimate customer service, clean stores, friendly staff, uh, you know, engaging with them and teaching them. They, they are dying for information. The consumer loves to hear stories and, and get information. And if you can provide that to them, the online click, and I have an online presence too, but the online click doesn't do that. And, you know, we, we, after this COVID-19, you know, we were closed for 70 days and uh, our online sales grew and our store got demolished. I mean, we lost more than 60% of our sales at the store. And my worry was, was the customer going to come back after that happened? And I'm like, geez, you know, they get used to clicking that button. It just shows up or something. Are they going to come back? Well, they came back stronger than ever. And it was so heartwarming to hear them when they came back of, I missed you so much. I missed this place so much. I appreciate you more than ever, not less than ever. I appreciate you exactly. more than ever. Exactly. And I said, all right, we've been doing it right all this time. And they, they came back stronger and better. Uh, absence makes the heart grow fonder if you're, you're good, right? Uh, and it's the time to reboot. If you weren't good, this is a time to reboot and repress that button and say, okay, let me make it better at this point. If, if they're not coming back in full steam, there's a reason for it. And it's hard to hear or, you know, having everybody tapping you on the back and say, I love this place or something, but truly look at it uh, and try to find where the problems are. Try to find the warts of your business, right? And wherever those problems are, try to try to improve them. 35 years, in, in those 70 days, I found a lot of problems because I had the, the time to look at it. I, our busy days that go by, sometimes we can't even look and focus. Or sometimes I ask somebody else, tell me the truth. What do you see here? Not a pat on the back. Tell me what's wrong so I can improve. We can all improve. As great as everything's going, we can get even better and better. Do trees grow to the sky? The answer is yes. A lot of people think, no, you've capped it out. You're one of the biggest brick and mortar retail shops that there are. J just stay the way it is. To an entrepreneur, I know you understand that it's, it's like a baseball player that wants to hit another home run. He's already broken the record. Why does he want to break the record next year, his own record? Just because we want to do it. it it's not a greed thing. It's, it's in us to be better and better and better as it goes on and generational in, in your case. And I, and I hope generational in my case. Absolutely. Yeah.
You know, David, I listen to you, and I, I re, you, it brings back wonderful memories of another Italian American, which I know you remember, uh, that always said it's better to have a small piece of a big pie, Carlito, than yeah, have the whole pie. Fred Zanaboni, he thought so much, and you know, and I believe so much, and I'm, and I, I'm so grateful that you do this and you support all the brick and mortar because you're absolutely right. And all the retail businesses that I've been uh, exposed to, I'm talking about Hublot with uh, luxury watches and Stefano Ricci with men's clothing. They all saying that it's about the experience. It's, you, it's not only selling a product, you sell an experience. And that is the personal touch of the human element. It's the relationships that are built. I've spent many times, not about cigars, about people. And you're evidence of that. And your success is evidence of that. And when you mentioned about your mistakes in the past, uh, I, I have never known a bigger promoter. Uh, it's like going to, you know, it's like going to a barn room and baby's, you know, circus or something, or, you know, wrestling match, Vince McMahon, uh, your events and everything from mo you know, from automobiles. I oh. see the guitar. I got a two guys guitar in my office. <laughs> yeah. No, really the wall right there in my office signed by all our colleagues all our manufacturers when we did the, the last event everybody signed it and uh it was for charity and my dad ended up buying it and sitting in my office and it's signed by every manufacturer that went on that tour so you know we i i really believe like you believe i believe that that you know it's necessary to have young blood to have creative blood people with a passion and everything the brick, you know, the young retailers, the brick and mortar, people that want to support our industry. It needs to continue to be fed with young people, young blood, oh people, just like you were when you first entered the business. And uh, it's, it's very special to see you speaking that way and doing that for others. The more you help others, the more you help yourself. I, I've always been, uh, you know, it, somewhat, I always was attracted to talking to older people. And Fred Zamboni was one of them that Fred would come into town and I would sit with him for hours and hours and try to be a sponge and listen to him telling me stories of what happened in the old days because history repeats itself. And he has a book that is not only a history book, but it's a, it's a future book because many things that he told me ended up happening later on. And because I ended up hearing the story, I actually know how this is going to end historically that's how it did before and i'll be damned if you know things that he said and all these people along the way that wow i think i know how this is going to end because somebody told me a story before and here it is and i'm able to make changes based on historical information that ended up happening uh, so he, he was another big influence of mine as it went on as cigar reps were different manufacturers along the way different competitors along the way um bob franz blau uh another one that had, had told me so many stories related or unrelated to the cigar industry but they were stories and one of the stories i have inside the book um uh, is um uh, about a guy that, you know, he had a big yacht, if you've ever been on his yacht there, and he had the second biggest yacht. At one time, it was the biggest yacht, and a bigger yacht came pulling in. Do you know the story? Frank and Essa? I, no, I don't, I don't know. I, it, wasn't, it wasn't Frank's. No, there was always a competition between Frank yeah. and Bob Francois, who had the biggest yacht. It, it's so interesting of billionaires, but the stories they end up telling, but how can, can this relate to me? The bigger yacht pulled in, and he's walking by one day, and the guy's on the deck, and he said, uh, "Hey, how you doing? Welcome to the um, welcome to the uh, yacht club." And he says, "Do you want to come on board?" And he said, "Yes." And he said, um, "Oh my God, you have the X74 uh, thing. I saw this on the front cover of Yacht Magazine." And he said, "If you don't mind me asking, what do you do for a living?" And the guy said, "Oh, I'm a um, electrician." And he says, you're an electrician. You know, this is a multi-million dollar yacht. And he goes, I can't believe it. He said, uh, an electrician, you must have one hell of a electrical company. And he says, well, you know, I have a trick of the trade that um, I get all the business. And he said, really? He says, would you like me to tell you what it is? And he said, sure. 
And he says, all right. And he looks around, make sure nobody's hearing because he's going to tell this unbelievable trick of the trade, how the guy got a yacht and he's an electrician. He said, when the phone rings, I answer it. And he said, when the phone rings, answer it. This is Bob telling me the story. He said, in other words, it's a long way of saying, um, you know, answer the phone when the phone rings or when opportunity knocks, take it. So here it is. And believe me, it stayed with me. I wrote a chapter in here about it. Opportunity knocks. You have to take the opportunity when it comes. And the, all these things as time went on. When opportunity knocks, answer the door. Somebody wrote that hundreds of years ago. And here's Bob hearing it from there. And then it carries on. These, these quotes are there for a reason. And if you can storytell those things and make somebody understand it, you can actually change their life at that point of the success of an electrician to be able to get as big as he ended up getting because he understood when opportunity knocks. So here's that story set in a different way from Bob telling me that story. But listen, these things aren't from me. These are things that I picked up and maybe tweaked and, and changed to, to work for the cigar industry. But these are um, wise people over the years, over my 60 years now, I'm 60 years old. Uh, I picked them up, I learned from them, I, I did them. And there's one thing of, of talking about it, but actually, uh, like Nike says, just do it. You gotta do it too. So all the tricks are here that I ever learned, uh, I think we should share. And if you guys have tricks, you should tell me what, what the tricks are too, because uh, rising, rising tides raise all ships. Absolutely. We can all do very good, yeah. <clears throat> Dave, uh, if there's one thing where you've had a uh, huge impact, and I remember when social media was not great, I remember you were on the board, it was RTD at that time, I was on the advisory committee, and we were the only two people at that time telling the board, the impact of what the bloggers were doing and how they would help us. But talking about that, how does the idea of Cigar Authority come up? Was it based on what you saw other people doing and you wanted to come up with something new, more, dy more dynamic? Because it's been on, I was on your show for your 10th anniversary. I mean, to do it for 10 consecutive years, one of the most probably watched cigar talk shows, I think in the world. So back to my days of the nightclub, uh, I worked at nightclubs because I tried to get a job in radio and I worked as a, uh, basically an apprentice. You work for free to try to learn what you're doing. And I was there for nine months looking for a job on air. And, um, they said, David, you're the hottest working guy here. We love you. You do everything in here, but you have a terrible Boston accent. And you have to get rid of that Boston accent. You can never be on the radio. And I tried to do it, but I couldn't do it. And the, the R's just didn't flow. And uh, it didn't end up happening. So I ended up doing the um, nightclub business because they wouldn't let me speak on there. So here was an opportunity when I heard about this podcasting. Now, we're going back 11 years ago. People didn't even know what podcasting was. And uh, my daughter, Gianna, tells me, you should get into social media. You got to be on here and chat with people and stuff. And I would put something out there. And then she says, they're talking to you. You have to go back on there and answer them. And I'm operating three retail stores, an online presence, uh, cigar brands and different things. And I said, I can't do this day to day. And, you know, I just can't end up doing it. I said, do it for me. And she said, I can't answer the questions. They're asking really about you. This is social media has to be you being social back to them. And I read this thing on social media, taking a flight somewhere. I got a book at the bookstore in the airport and it was about social media and it mentioned podcasting. And what I liked about it, it was a one way conversation and I would get to end up saying what I wanted to, but I would bring on people onto the show to interview and co-host and things like that and try to bring in the things that happen in the cigar lounge that was happening right below me, that people were sitting down having a conversation. We talk a little about the cigar we're talking about, but then it goes off a little there and it goes a little back to the cigar. And that was the idea of it. Little did I know, hope, hopefully some people would see it and come into two guys, 
because they'll hear about us. But little did I know that it would not only become a national show, but become international, that this podcasting thing, unlike radio, isn't where the area is. Uh, and I know Sagar Dave, who was for years and years of the radio station where it was, he has just went into podcasting full time. Uh, I saw that 11 years ago that that that's looks like where it was and he gets it and he understands it. and you're talking about a, a great radio man uh, that sees that times have changed. We saw this uh, at IPCPR on the board. Maybe it was RTDA, by the way. RTDA uh, it was. Yeah, it would have been right. 2009. Uh, so we saw that this social media thing that's happening in here had, and I knew it because I have a retail store and somebody would come in and ask for a, a cigar brand that we didn't carry that I didn't know about. Well, how are they finding out about this before I'm finding out about it? And this world of social media is there. And these folks that are there, by the way, and 99% of them are lovers of cigars. They have no horse in this game that they, they're not profiting from it. They, they have this thing that they love. And they're putting this out there, and this information is being gathered, and the trade show didn't want them in there. And I'm like, it's free advertising. They love this product. They love this product more than some people that are in the industry. That's how much they love it. They pay their own way to go. How do you not love them back? Um, I just don't get it. But – it was the same when barcodes came before barcodes came on cigars and people brick and mortar retailers didn't want to put computer systems in their store. When online started, I incidentally was the second on online retailer to have online presence. Uh, I try to stay youthful with the future that's going on. I know I'm getting older, but I, I, I embrace the new thing that's coming out as opposed to push back. We don't want change. We're scared of change. We don't want it. It's going to roll past us if we don't do this. We have to embrace the change that's happening and look for the better of it because for the most part, it is better. Um, Jose Lito was saying when, uh, when I went down there with my family to um, Dominican Republic, this, this is the cigar box that you gave my daughter, Gianna. Yes. Uh, who was it? Three years old, three years old at the time. And you signed the box uh, in the uh, 1998 to Gianna. And you, kept it. you kept it. I kept it all this time. Unfortunately, the cigars are gone. They were delicious. <laughs> the, the cigars, were, but um, yep. We, let me tell you, I, I, we don't keep many many uh, empty boxes of cigars. I like full boxes of cigars myself. But we kept this one, and we look at it often. We look at it often of um, not only did I go on that trip, but I took my mother on the trip, like you mentioned. I took my wife on the trip, and I took my little daughter, uh, four years old at the time, four years old on the trip. She sold her heart. So obviously she was the one that sold her heart. Yes, she yes. Has, she has a cigar, a full cigar box where no one could even get two cigars at a time. Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> It was, it was something to remember, and unfortunately, I talk to her about it all the time. She was four years old. She doesn't remember, but she remembers the pictures. We look at pictures of what happened, but certainly my mother and my wife do, and we talk about it all the time. It was uh, a really special time, and watching what was happening with Opus X at the time, everything was, oh, my God, there was, there was no such thing as this. Um, it, it was a big deal for us. Uh, thank you so much for it all these years later. That was uh, 20... 22 years ago, 22 wow. years ago, yeah. So Gianna now is 26, 27, huh? 20, she's, she'll be 26 in October. Oh, my God. Oh yeah. My God. She must be a beautiful lady. No she doubt. is, she's, and she's a good kid. Um, uh, I'd love to get her in here full time. She helps us out with little things. Uh, my mother's the accounts payable person from home, and she does some things there, but she never took to the sales thing. You know, you're either embedded in sales or not, or who knows, who knows uh, what the future holds. I'd love to have her. Uh, she's the only one I have. So if it's going to go to anybody, uh, I would love it to be her. And, and well, daddy, daddy's getting older in case you're, you're watching this. Come on board. You know, I'm the one who's getting older. My children, all of them. But I just want to say to, Lee, to the Fuente family, to Cynthia, to Liana, to all of my children, it'd be a huge honor 
if Gianni could be a guest once all this is over, all these uh, struggles that we're facing, we would love to invite her, bring her down, and for her to see where she was at has changed completely in business of our family, Terrible Foundation, the children, the factory, and so forth. And uh, leave it up to Uncle Carlos to to, uh, <laughs> her, to want to be with Dad because that's really, it's all about family, it's about love and the passion. So that's beautiful, brother. And Gianna, if you are listening, and she probably is listening, this is when opportunity knocks. I hope you yeah. can hear this, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah of course. There's, there's no need to say it, but you're always invited, Mom, and anybody. It, it would be it would be a huge honor again for you to see, after all these years, uh, the changes for the best and, and all the development and everything, especially the foundation. When you were there, I don't know if you remember the children that wanted to dance for you and everything. Yes, they did, because yeah. They, Schools at that time, there was, you know, they were just looking for hand-me-downs or, or they could work that they, today they're professionals, you know, today they, they graduate from universities and, you know, they're teachers, doctors, entrepreneurs and everything. So it's just, it's beautiful. And you were part of it in the very beginning. No, and, and this is, and this is part of success too, is giving back, right? As blessed as we all are. And uh, we did good with life, the beautiful part of it. And I, and I never, I'm, I'm such a well-wisher for everybody. It's always been the, been the way um, because the better somebody else can be, the more they can do for somebody else. So at this point in my life, I could do more than I could in those days because I had nothing. Uh, I'm trying to make a living and get by. And as we get better, you know, I, I, I just... The evil of people that look at other people of jealousy uh, is terrible because they have to look at a different way because the person that ends up doing good can do more good for somebody else. So, uh, you know, th these are things I'm learning as along the way, and I, and I hope I pass that. That's my goal now is to, is to pass on the things I have learned. That, that's my plan of now and, till the end. And my answer to your philosophy is something that I didn't know what the hell it meant was something that my daughter, Liviana, told me after I said something. It was very simple. Word. That's my answer for you. Word. The younger kids know what that means. Word. Checkmate. That's it. Right. That's it. So we could all learn from the younger people also. Yeah, absolutely. I would, love to, from, I would well, love to learn a lot from Diana. So would yeah. we. David, uh, you mentioned, <clears throat> you and I have talked about, you know, tobacconists, hobbyists, People that might have gone to your shop, they're retired, they go to a little strip mall, get 800 square feet, open a shop, a year later, they're out of it. Yeah. What do you think it's the biggest mistake? And it could be, because you and I have seen shops in your area that were around for 100 years that are not around anymore. What is one of the biggest mistakes, whether you've been for a year, 10 years, 20 years, that a lot of retailers make? Well, and, and I'm not one to preach. I started Two Guys Smoke Shop with $6,000. Um, and as luck would have it, I got through it because I had a second job. But it, usually it's work and capital. Uh, and I, I saw this so much during COVID-19 that's been going on. If you did not have some money in the bank put aside, I mean, we were bleeding out there for a while. And I never lived paycheck to paycheck, but I, I also never lived 70, maybe 72 days out of, of the business being closed. Um, that was a big part of, part of it. And I was very worried for a lot of people, but up here, um, you know, I see shops, restaurants and things closed, maybe closed forever because they couldn't get through the bad time. So you have to be able to get through the good times and the bad times, right? So you prepare for the worst, hope for the best, but prepare for the worst that would end up happening. So, uh, you know, coming in, there was overspending also that people would say, I'm gonna, uh, you know, I want the best of the best. And, you know, my first counter was, you know, plywood on top of uh, some uh, two by fours. And that was the counter because that's what I could do at the time. Uh, but people going into debt and then trying to recover out of it. And, and that goes for restaurants, that goes for everybody is the, usually the biggest mistake is undercapitalization of doing it. Um, location, 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 that's another thing um, where we started out in little bad areas because that's all I could afford 
low rent district of uh, the areas that I that I put in. When we moved to New Hampshire, we actually opened up on the main strip. And my God, the day we opened was the was the biggest day in company history. It was opening day at that time, and I had ten years behind me. But that was the busiest day. Then I figured out when I moved across the street from that store that I was on the wrong side of the street. There's a right side and the wrong side of the street when it comes to retail. And uh, I didn't know, but now I know. And oh my God, my business grew 30% overnight, moving on the other side of the street. I was noticed and uh, that came. So all these things of, um, and you know, how do you figure it out? How I learned it after I did the first one is right down the street from me is McDonald's. I can see it. And if you go to my three retail stores, from each one of my stores, you can see McDonald's from each one of the stores. Now, McDonald's spends hundreds of thousands of dollars to figure out where the location of McDonald's should be. It's not just, oh my God, here's an empty, empty lot. Let me put a McDonald's there. Oh no, they meet the traffic. They do a lot of work that goes into where a McDonald's is going to go. They already did the work for me. If I can see McDonald's from my store, okay, the traffic count is going to be correct. The on and off the ramp is going to be correct. All the different things that end up happening. So, you know, it, it's not just, I got lucky. I, I studied other things other than the cigar industry. I, I studied the restaurant industry and know the McDonald's is the biggest and best when it comes to that. And you want a custom account, you go near McDonald's. Lots of things like that to, to end up looking at. And um, ask the questions, you know, and I was asking the questions back in 1985 and nobody would answer it. You as a successful retailer that has listened to the show, you, you can't hold it close. Give, give it up. Give it up and share your information. And believe me, the same hand might not be the one that feeds you, but if you believe in and what comes around goes around type of thing, I do. Um, I've been giving my whole life and I've been getting it back 10 times more. So the more I give, the more I get back. It's reciprocity, right? You give, give as get, and it comes back in spades if you end up doing it. Uh, I believe it. And it's worked for me, and and I'm you know I'm talking to somebody who has a foundation, so uh, he he knows all that well too. That um, that's the way it goes. No question, absolutely. David, yeah, as your as your partners, a... the Newmans too, the same thing. Exactly. How giving they are, my God. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, David. If there's one thing you'd like to highlight, one of the tips in your book that you would like to share with the audience, which one would it be? Oh my God, there's so many good ones that are there. It's, it's, it's hard to say. Um, you know, uh, one of the things we do that's been very successful for us is, I said education uh, is a big thing that the consumer wants education. And for years, I would give a box of cigars to every charity that ever asked me. Um, you know, and having three, um, you know, very uh, big stores that are there. We get lots of people that ask and you give the box of cigars. I happen to have gone to one of those um, events that they were giving away some of the prizes and the guy picks up the box of cigars and says, okay, and this is a box of cigars from Two Brothers Store and they read off the raffle ticket. They didn't call it Two Guys Smoke Shop. They said Two Brothers Store. They didn't say where it was. They didn't say anything. And there was a $150 box of cigars going. And I go, there's got to be a better way. Yes, I gave to it. Nobody cared. It cost me the money. And there was less out of it. So we created something called a cigar tasting for eight. And every Thursday night in the store, and now we do two at a time, I can, I can do two groups of eight at the same time, 16 people. We give a, a certificate to the charity, and they give away a cigar tasting for eight. Eight people come up. Some of them are regular cigar smokers. Some of them never smoked cigars before in their life. Some smoke every once in a while. You get a mixture of every single thing that comes up. And I teach them the proper way to cut light and smoke a cigar. And I sit with them, and we have a glass of wine, and we smoke a cigar. And we basically break, break bread, and we talk about cigars. I, I talk about, a little about Two Guys and, and why Two Guys is a good store and how we climate control everything and everything's in perfect condition. I take away the myths when people ask questions, oh, this must be strong because it's a Maduro, or this must be this, and we clear up everything we can. And as they leave after it's over, 
they got to know me. They got educated because that's a very important thing, education. That's what I love about Cigar Aficionado. What it did for our industry was educate. And boy, did it change the world as that happened. And we continue to educate. That's what the Cigar Authority is about. But they leave and they actually spend money before they leave. So it actually turned into a money. I'm giving to a charity and I'm getting back. And we average about $380 per group of eight. And that's how it comes out because we've been doing it for years and years. We get new customers. We create new cigar smokers. Uh, we take away from the myths of the, uh, uh, the unhealthiness to it and, and everything. You know, obviously cigars are bad for you. And I explained to them why it's not true. And we clear that up. Um, Jose, I, I've been to your tasting seminars. To talk about education. You are the professor. Um, you know how that works. You've been doing it over and over and over. Um, these things, you know, do I get tired of hearing myself talk after a while? Yeah, but we're bringing the next group in at that point. They have never heard what I'm saying. You know, I, I've said what I'm saying to you now before. This is the first time I'm saying what I'm saying. And I know it, but whoever is listening out there maybe didn't hear this before, and maybe it's going to help them. You did the seminar. Even when I went down to Florida to Corona, I sat in your seminar at somebody else's store, even though I heard it two times before in my own store. Um, but you never know the, the extra things you pick up. Like when I have that group of eight there, some guys say they smoke cigars all the time. They've been smoking cigars longer than me. Okay. I said, maybe you'll learn something tonight at the end. At the end of it, they always say, oh my God, I never knew this, this, this. I picked up that or whatever. Education is so powerful. And in this industry, I promise you, they want the education. That You're not throwing it. You're not pushing it at them. They want it. They want it so bad. I wanted it. Before Cigar Aficionado, there was no education of cigars. And I, when I got it, oh, my God, I read that issue one from cover to cover 10 times and just couldn't get enough of it and learn from it. There's another generation coming in. There's new cigar smokers every day. Educate your customer when it comes in here. It will pay back in spades. They'll like it, and, they'll, and you need to be educated, too. I need to be educated, too. I, I watch these things. You know, oh, you've been around for 35 years. I learned from every single show. You had Ernesto Perez Carrillo. He's been my friend since the 80s. I watched that show. I learned a lot from that show of things that I didn't know, even though I talked to him so many different times. Yeah. That was, a gr that was great. I get to edit wow. them, so every time I get to watch them over and over and over again, I'm learning something new every time. <laughs> Uh, David, there are a lot of questions that have come in, um, but there's a few in particular and one from a colleague of yours um, who admires you very much, who's a huge fan and who I'm going to try to bring on live to, uh, to ask her question. Ladies and gentlemen, Mrs. Angela Yu. Angela, can you hear me? Hi, Angela. Hello. Hi. Is my Hello. audio working? Yeah. Yes, it is. Welcome. Oh my gosh. Okay. First of all, I'm the biggest Dave Garofalo fangirl in the entire freaking world. Like people have role models, people have celebrities they want to meet. But every time I see Dave at IPCPR, I always geek out because he is someone as a retailer that I look up to tremendously. And I'm sure he knows that because I always say it, but my one question, which was already answered, was the number one mistake that retailers make. But I guess he, you know, covered that when he talked about um, protecting your capital and whatnot. So yeah. that was my question that I had. Oh, and my other question is, can I be your intern one summer? Like, you don't even have to pay me. I just want to be a sponge and learn from you. Angela, you're a rock star. And I watched <laughs> you, I watched you from building that first store, uh, you know, with the, with the saw and, and doing the label and all that stuff. And I watched you from the very beginning. I've been paying attention to you uh, and, and watching the stuff you're doing. And I'm in awe. You are a, you are a talented girl uh, for the displays that you make, for uh, you're a musician. You're, uh, you got it all, girl. You got it all. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. Well, if you're ever looking for an intern, let me know. You don't have to pay me. I'll be your intern for an entire summer. If you come out, you come up here anytime, uh, which you did come up here before. So thank you so I much did for that. A couple of years ago. So yeah. thank you so much. I appreciate it. 
Thank, Thank you okay. very much, hey, Angela. Rick, you have, what, the ne on your next expansion, you need a carpenter and somebody to take care of your building. You know who to call. Boy, she is unbelievable. She 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 does it all. You know, even, even pours asphalt on the parking lot. It, it's it's oh, yeah. unreal. If you want me to paint your parking lot and do new handicapped parking spaces, I can do it for you. I'm sure you can. I'm sure you can. You can do it all. And that, and, and that you, so if every, any, everybody that's listening here, she, she is a rock star. She's unbelievable what she does. And she wants to learn more. And that's, this is the funny thing about successful people. Watch uh, how successful people are. They want more. They want to learn more. They want to keep going. It, I see this in all kinds of industries and, and how people are. And you'll notice that they're all the same in certain ways. So if you see that Carlito is the same as me in this respect, that Angela is the same way, that Jose is the same way, there's got to be something to it, right? And yeah. just do it. Then do that. Because that's it. That, that's how I, what I did. I just watched a whole bunch of successful people doing the same thing. And I go, well, this must be the way. And then I try it and I go, yeah, it is the way. Yeah, I always get advice from the person that's been where I want to go. You're right. That's it. Watch the person where you want to go, right? You dress for the job that you want to have, not the one that, you, that you're in. And uh, you hear all these cliche things that are out there. They're there and they last many, many generations because they're true. Absolutely. David, all eyes on you. It's time for Melanie's Hotspot. Melody. Oh, boy. <laughs> so, David, you sound like you've had a lot of experiences, so I'm just going to go for my favorite question. Give us your most embarrassing experience with your cigar industry life. In my cigar industry, embarrassing. Well, there's been failures. Has that been embarrassing of failures? Uh, the biggest failure I ever did David, in the cigar industry, David, yeah? No, no, we don't want to hear any of the clean stuff. We want the embarrassing moments. Or a funny moment. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, any dirty stuff or anything. I can't think of anything. Um, Whatever you want. This is broadcasted out of Switzerland. There's no legal repercussions. All right, then I have another question. No. I have another question. Yeah. Your biggest cigar character that comes into your... Uh, lounge. Wow. You know, I, I got uh, Hollywood called me once and they wanted to do a show from here, um, much like Cheers, but uh, cigar related. And as it turns out, because of the smoking thing, they couldn't they couldn't do the show because we have characters like <laughs> like all cigar shops do. And the odd thing about it is, you know, I've had three stores in Massachusetts. Now I have three stores up here. So I've had a total of six, six different stores. And we all have our lounge lizards, right? The guys that hang around the stores and all this stuff. And I and talking to other retailers, we all have the same guy, right? <laughs> We all have the Cliff Clave and the know-it-all guy from Cheers that he has a different name, and I have one at each store, and he's a different person. He looks different, but he's the same guy at all six stores and the guy on TV, and we all have this other guy and this other guy, and talking to other retailers, I don't care what part of the country they're in, we all have these, these things. What to do with that person is a different story of of what they do that, you know, some of them uh, can actually hurt your business and, and all the stuff like this. But um, man, I don't know. I've, I've had everybody from gangsters. I mean, real hardcore gangsters, because we were in, in Somerville, you hear the Whitey Bulger story, Whitey Bulger. You ever hear about him? Oh yeah. They made movies and stuff about him. He was from Winter Hill, Somerville. And that's where the first two guy smoke shop was 1985. And who do you think were buying cigars in 1985 in Winter Hill, Somerville? Them. And I'm a 25 year old kid and I didn't know who they were. They were just customers coming and buying cigars. And knock on wood, as luck would have it, I wasn't doing any kind of business there at that time or they would have took it. They would have took my business. But I didn't do any business, so they came in and bought a couple of cigars and didn't say anything and stuff. But those were hardcore bad dudes. Um, Man, these are, it's, it's hard to pinpoint one person. Uh, you know, over the years, I'm going to tell you a story. Uh, we had one customer that went in for exploratory surgery, 
and his name was Mike, and he was a guy that came in every single day, and he was only 42 years old, I think, and he says, you know, there's something with my stomach or something, they're going in tomorrow to look at some exploratory surgery, and uh, he says, I probably won't be in tomorrow, but I'll see you the next day. I said, okay, Mike, good luck with it. I'll be thinking of you. He died on the operating table from the anesthesia, so... The next day, everybody's talking about it and says, oh, my God, he died. And um, 42 years old with a, a wife and a young daughter. And I'm like, oh, my God. So I went to the funeral. And I didn't say anything to anybody, but I was just going to the funeral. I go to the church, and I see all my customers uh, on the stairway. And I'm walking up the stairs to go into the church. And I said, hey, how you doing? I'm glad. Isn't it nice you came? And whatever. And I go sit towards the back. And the priest gets on. And the priest talks about this guy's two families. One was his family that was sitting in the front row. And the other family were the people at Two Guys Smoke Shop. And here I am sitting at the back. And I'm like, what is he talking about? And uh, he got into it a lot. And at the end, they're bringing a casket out. And the six pallbearers were all customers of the store. And as I got out, I'm getting all goosebumps just talking about it. The whole stairway was all my customers and a lot of them. And I look and I have a puzzled look on my face. And they said, Dave, stand over here with us. And it was all us. And then um, everybody goes to the, church, to the cemetery and the priest gets up and actually removes a piece of the casket from there and hands it to the wife. And then she gets up and she calls me up there. And I don't know what's going on at that point. And they present the casket, the piece of the casket to me. And I said, you know, I, I'm like befuddled of what, what this is all about and why is two guys playing such a role. And after it's over, they said, don't you know what Two Guys Smoke Shop is all about? Don't you know what you've done to all these people that our best friends are um, from the cigar store where they met, that we vacationed together, and our whole life has been brought because of this? Don't you know this? And the answer is, I, no, I don't. Because I come in and I have work to do, and it's not just waiting on the customers and all this stuff. And I said, I had no idea. And... Uh, I, I said, oh, my God. And they said, I hope you'll come over our house after this. And we're having a little gathering. And I said, of course. And I go there, and everything changed at that point. Everything changed for me that we are more than a place that sells cigars, that we are part of the people's lives. And we, that's, that's what I thought I did was sell cigars, and that's not what we do. Carlito, that's not what you do either. You have touched people's hearts. And me as the person just selling it, I'm a retailer. But it's, it's a different thing of this. And it was the man that died that, that was the, the biggest influence to change my life. After he died, he has no idea of what happened. After he did that, I said, okay. And it was, this was, I was a good 23 years in business at that point, not knowing. And at that point, I said, okay, this is more than just a cigar store that we sell cigars. We are in these people's families. You, you call yourself the cigar family, so you figured it out a lot earlier than I did that, that this is it. This is more than um, a business that we're in. This is, this is part of their family. And it's amazing, and it's even wonderful, even more wonderful as it goes. And I will never leave this business now uh, after realizing this, but I spent 23 years without knowing it. So I hope I'm telling something to another retailer that's out there that this is uh, really, you don't know how important you are to these people. So uh, get up in the morning and smile because the customer walks into my store, they have a smile on their face and to give me money. You don't get a lot of people going into stores to spend money with a smile on their face. That is a cigar shop, that they're happy to do it. This is a vacation from their troubles. It's, it's a whole different world. It's a wonderful world, the cigar industry, a wonderful world. Amen. That was beautiful, David. David, we have a little ritual on the show. Uh, we tend to give a little joke, and uh, who better to do it than our, French, our friend Rich Myberg? Rich, what's the joke of the day? Well, I'm uh, a little choked up with uh, David being here. David, you and I had a brief conversation in Vegas back in January 
and uh, we talked about your book and then talked about, you know, how so many cigar retailers let money walk out the door without offering them accessories with every, every purchase. You said, write a book. Well, I'm, I'm a little older than you and uh, not as old as uh, um, uh, Mr. Padron, uh, but uh, I was 74 last Wednesday, uh, two days Happy before my friend. Happy birthday, Rich. Well, yeah. two days before my friend Cashew, Tony Cattengill's birthday. And uh, it was an exciting birthday because um, on Facebook, uh, I was able to raise an additional $375 for Cigar Family Charitable Foundation in honor of my birthday, which tickled me be beautifully. And then uh, later in the week, someone whose life I followed quite a bit asked me to be friends on Facebook. Carito, you know this young man, Emilio Antonio Carabito. He asked me to become friends on Facebook. Boy, that just made my week. What a beautiful thing. Uh, well, getting back to what I'm supposed to be doing, guy I know is in the hospital with a little COVID problem, and he's wearing that face mask thing over his mask, and a nurse comes in and says, uh, uh, oh, you okay? He says, are my testicles black? She says, I'm sorry, sir. I'm just here to check your vitals, blood pressure, heartbeat. You know, I, no, he says, really, are my testicles black? She says, I, I can't answer that kind of question. He says, please tell me, are my testicles black? Well, she lifts up his uh, bed sheets and she reaches underneath and he's so excited. He, he does what guys do when they get real excited. And then she, she turns around to leave and he says, takes off his mask says, I'm sorry, but are my test results back? <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Rich, that was wonderful. Thank you very much. That was good, Rich, absolutely. Thank you guys. Dave, I'm going to ask you uh, my last question. I know Carlito has something to say in Jeremiah <clears throat> also. You've seen the rise and the fall of many companies. In your opinion, what really makes a company successful? Uh, as short of, uh, of, of seeming like an ass kisser here, but it's the truth. It, it was, uh, something, uh, during the cigar, cigar boom, as I was one of the retailers begging for product to end up having. And the, um, tagline of Fuente came out, which was never rush the hands of time. Um, and what is that all about? You know, before that, it, it was something else or something. But seeing that, we never rushed the, the hands of time and going down there and see the factory. And me asking Carlito back in 1998, um, look at all these cigars. Well, they're not ready until a certain time. And I said, can you just send them out anyway? And the answer was no. And during the boom, we saw a lot of that. We saw people rushing it out. I tell people all the time, uh, the cigar boom to me, was when cigars tasted the worst. With the exception of Fuente, an exception of very few people at that time, cigars were at their worst because everybody was doing the wrong thing. The money was there, though. You could have certainly put them out and, and turned it into money because everybody was buying anything. Believe me, we were selling every cigar we could get. But for longevity, for the long haul of the, of the cigar business, it's do it right no matter what. You know, you can't go for the short dollar. You got to play the long game. And that's what Fuente has always done. They played a long game, despite people like me begging for product and saying, I'll give you more money for it. I'll do whatever I can do. I need cigars over there. And the answer is no, we're playing the long game here. We're not going to put it out until it's ready. Very frustrating to me then. Now I understand it completely, the right move. And that's what we're seeing that happens, that people rush to market, we're talking about new products that come out, handing me a cigar at a trade show and saying, okay, we're ready to have this and tasting it. And Jose, you know, the cigar's not ready. You taste it and you, you know, my God, what are they doing? They're doing it because it's that time of year to come out with the new product. Well, there's nobody worse or better than saying they're coming out with a product and then it's years later before the product comes out. As for Wente, when it's not ready, it's not ready. It doesn't matter the timing. It doesn't matter that people are handing there to try to hand the money to it. We're gonna actually hurt the brand name if we end up putting a bad product out there. And that becomes the difference of it. And you know who I'm talking about, the good ones that do the right thing and don't rush it, and then the bad ones that didn't. Coincidentally, the ones that did it the right way and went slow, 
are the ones that keep going and are successful and the ones that rush it and take the short dollar are the ones that end up going down. It's just history. History tells me that all the way through. And here we are again. You know, and I watched them go off the deep end of, and then deep discounting and ruin their brands and things like that. And as retailers, we have to be nervous of what we take in because, you know, I don't want to provide a bad cigar to a customer either because we're the line of defense. You know, you, th this company may make a bad cigar and end up selling it off, but I'm the guy that has to stand there and sell it to them. And, and who do you think they throw the cigar at at that point? It's us on the, on the receiving end. So a retailer has to be sh sharp about what they buy and a manufacturer has to be sharp about what they're putting into the market because it's going to dictate success or failure in the long run, not yeah. the short run. Proof. <laughs> Alito. It's the absolute truth. You know, I've learned so much uh, listening to David for many things. It reinforces a lot of things that I believe in. And to listen to his experience and his wisdom, uh, I just hope, I wish David it's a long life and to continue to do what you do. One, thing, you. Of, one thing that obviously that uh, is, is, is an element of success is one of the secret ingredients. It's what David has an abundance of, and his passion and belief. I mean, his dedication and everything he does. I just, uh, very, we're blessed, all of us, to have someone like David Garofalo in, in the cigar industry. And um, I'm so proud that he wants to share his, his experiences with other brick and mortars, because I believe in brick and mortars. Brick and mortars build brands, and they, they sell the experience, and they have the personal contact. So David, keep on doing what you're doing. I wish you all the health and just continue being the leader that you are to all of us. You're unbelievable. Thank you. Uh, nobody gives a show like you. And I know why now that I know all your past secrets that you say may have been mistakes, but I think they weren't. Because I think that uh, if this man ever needs a replacement for a wrestling, <laughs> you'll, be, you'll be the promoter. You know, so congratulations, my friend. And thank, thank you for the huge you. honor, the huge honor uh, to accept this invitation. Uh, this is, this is going to be a show that goes down in history. And I hope that every retailer or every business retailer from all walks of life, listen to this because there's so much to learn. And I have learned a lot in this program. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart, my friend. Oh, it's all my honor, please. It's, it was an honor to be asked. I couldn't believe I was even asked to be here. Um, you know, happy to do it and honored to that I was even asked, so uh, thank you. Oh, da David Carlito wrapped it up very well, and um, you know I have to tell you, there's uh, there's on the chat board right here. Thank you, David. The cigar industry needs more like David. Thank you for all what you do. Just flooding in on the on the uh, on on the chats everywhere, David. You're amazing. It was it was an honor and a pleasure to have you on the show today. I, I have to admit, I learned a lot from you, and I wish that I can spend more time in the future. You know, listening to your stories and and your experience. You're you're truly a gentleman and um, uh, one of the greats that I've met um, in my in my career. It was it was an honor and a pleasure. It was an enormous surprise, and I think we're all blessed to have you on the show today. And and from the bottom of all our hearts, we thank you very, very, very much. Keep doing what you're doing. Um, you say it as it is. It's refreshing. Um, and we love you very much. Thank you very, very much, thank David. Thank you. Thank you. Very touched. Thank you. At 60 years of life, you're the Carl Ustrimsky of the cigar. Ah, so, there we go. There you know, we go. Get one more. Hit one more out of the park, my friend. I we're, hope so. Thank you. We're rooting for you. <laughs> yes. All right, David. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Professor, who's coming on the show next Sunday? Well, next Sunday, I think we're going to have a, a great show. A great friend of mine, a very good friend of Carlito, Mr. David Savona from Cigar Aficionado. We, 25 I years. Know, 25 I know, years. Yep. 25 years. I, I read his blog. Uh, David and I are big uh, Yankee fans. And... Uh, we used to talk a lot. Now we don't talk as much, but uh, it's going to be interesting. And uh, we invite everybody uh, to see the show next Sunday. And David, again, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. I knew you wouldn't say no. 
<laughs> and we've learned a lot. We've been friends for many years. And I've always said that uh, you always come up with ideas totally different from everybody. But I'm glad that uh, you made a lot of things for social media in our industry change a lot. So thank you very much from, from us here at uh, Meet the Professor. Thank you. Thank All you. right. Ladies and gentlemen, make sure to log on next Sunday, same place, same time for another episode of Fuente and Marifal present Meet the Professor. In the meantime, take care, stay safe, take care of yourselves and of others. Bye-bye for now. Bye. Bye. Have a great evening.